be making your way in here. Um, I've had a good week. Me too. And, and you know, when I look at the common denominator of what's made it a good week, it has been, I have, I hate to say reactivated, but I guess I'm just going to be honest and say reactivated a grateful heart. And, and giving thanks and praise and being consciously aware of every single good thing in my life, from the little things to the big things. And I have found myself just reaping the benefits of thanksgiving. Um, last night, Chris and I um, went on a date, and we left the house and we left our kids at home because we're at that phase in life where we can just tag our teenagers and say, you're it. And this is new territory for us. And I was giving thanks and praise for this aspect of life. And, and you guys know what it's like. You've already been able to do that. And it was fun. And it's great. And then this morning, I got up. Regardless of the weather, I don't know what it is, every Sunday it seems like this has been the weather, but I've been so glad to be in this house and to give thanks. So I encourage you this morning to allow thanksgiving, allow praise and gratitude to be what flows from you and through you. And I promise you, you're going to be standing here next Sunday, maybe not with the microphone unless you want to, saying, it's been a good week. So stand with us, worship with us, and allow thanksgiving to just flow and fill this room. Father, we enter into your presence with thanksgiving. We enter into your courts with praise, and we say, this is the day that you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in every small thing, every large thing, because you have made it, you have designed it, and we worship you, and we give you praise, and everyone says amen.
I read something this week that says if you can't step outside and look at the sky and stop in your tracks and just marvel at the mystery of the vastness of God, our creator, then you might need to take a second and recheck where you are, where you are in your walk for that moment. Thank you, Father, for the mystery that we'll never fully comprehend the science of the universe, your unending grace, the depths of your love. And I ask all of you today to step into his presence with us, full of gratefulness, full of wonder, like a child. If you notice children running around the church when we let out and how they marvel at everything, can we not stand here today and marvel just in the presence of God and the beauty and the wonder of his creation and his love? stars in the night I wonder at your lightning in the sky I shudder your glory is a blanket that covers every living thing I'm in awe of the majesty
just want more of you today. than what we've stepped into, more than what we're already walking in, more truth, more unfolding, more of your peace, more of your love and your direction and your guidance, more of your healing in every moment. You're so thankful. more of you. Our ears are open. We are listening to your voice. We thank you that you are constantly speaking, Father. We just open ourselves to receive you.
always been about hurt people and how much power is inside of hurt people. And for years I was hurt and it took me being on this stage and being around all y'all all the time to finally wipe away that, but I'm not hurt anymore. And while that's amazing, what happens after that is one of two things. And I've experienced both here lately is that you either protect yourself forever from being hurt again, which I've done, or you shift your focus onto other people that are hurt and you become a minister. And that's what I want to do now. It would be easy for me to continue feeding myself the same thing forever because it fixed me. That would be a really safe way of going about it. And I would probably do okay. But now, I want more. I want for other people that, was, that were where I was to be where I am now. And that has a whole new set of risks involved. That's empathy. I have to, I have to put myself where the hurt person is. And the first, I'm on the first step of that. And my first step is to look and say, you're not bad, you're good. It's my first step. Wherever you are, whatever shoes you're in, you're not unfixable. You're hurt, and that's okay. I've been there too. And this song is, is saying, I'm hurt, and that's okay. And I'm going to get up, and I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to keep being in this world. I'm going to keep seeing the people that have hurt me and I'm going to keep being me and eventually if I walk that long enough I get to change that into being a minister that's what this song is for me
You know, I want to pray an unusual, maybe, prayer of thanksgiving. I um, have just thought this week how good things are, how the economy is better than it's been in a long time, how many, we have a lot of young couples in our church, and so many of them out today, and I thank God for that. I thank God because they have the means to go with their family somewhere and to celebrate life together, find a restful time together. We're going to be talking about rest this morning, and um, it's a beautiful word that we all need, right? We all need rest. So, God, we thank you for our economy. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have placed in this nation. Thank you for all the things that we have. Thank you, God, for the convenient things that we have. Thank you that our life is so much easier than it used to be, and and Lord, we know that that comes from the Creator. We know, God, that you have placed this wisdom inside of mankind that they can cause things to come about that's going to make life better for them. Thank you for the medical profession. Thank you, God, for the advances that's been in that that's caused people's lives to be better and to be more healthy, Lord, than ever. And we just give you thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Wow, that's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you just kind of tap on them keys just for a little bit while I read some scriptures. Is that cool? I, um, uh, Reclaiming Our Ancient Paths is a series we're starting this morning that I just have to tell you I'm very sentimental about. Uh, my text is going to be out of two passages of Scripture that have been mainstays in my life. They have been um, Scriptures I've gone to over and over again to remind me of this awesome God we serve and what He's up to. I, it reminds me of my past. I thank God for all the stages of life that I've gone through that have led me from one thing to the next. Um, God is good, and He's good all the time. I thank God for my childhood. As I said uh, a couple of weeks ago on Easter, I didn't choose Christianity. I was raised in it. I didn't have a choice. We went to church, and we didn't want to go to church. I went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and every night of revival when it came along. I remember we used to have service on Sunday night at 7.30. Can you believe that? <laughs> Most of you are in bed at 7.30. 7.30 we had church, and then 7.30 on Wednesday night, and, and 7.30 in revival night. How many remember those times? And uh, I just thank God for my ancient paths. Thank God for how, where, where he's led me down through the years my mom and dad's in heaven now and I thank God for what they instilled in me I thank God that uh, when I would come home drunk my mother would be in the den on her knees 
praying and never say a word to me. She just prayed. And I'll never forget her prayers. I'll never forget her prayer. I'll never, I'll never forget getting in. And back then, my mother ironed sheets. Anybody ever remember ironing sheets? <laughs> Iron the sheets. And they, you'd get in them, and they'd just be real crisp, you know. And, but what I remember was getting in those clean, white, crisp sheets, okay? And my mother's in there praying loud enough so I can hear she, she wasn't going. It was, God, hear me, I cry. I pray for my children, my Eddie. God, save Eddie. God, save Buren. God, convict them. And I'm laying there in between those white sheets going, I wish she would stop praying. I just can't wait until she goes to bed. But I thank God she didn't stop praying because God answers prayer we have been praying for people far away from God over the last six weeks and seeing people come back to God seeing people renewed and refreshed this uh if you're a guest with us this morning this word kainos on the back of the wall is not a Greek fraternity it's a Greek word though and it, it is the Greek word for new and there's two words for new in the Bible. There's neos, say neos. Neos means it's new in time. It never existed before, something brand new. That's used a few times in Scripture, but the one that's used the most is this word kainos, say kainos. Kainos means it is renewed. It means uh, this shirt was once new. It's not new anymore, uh, but it got renewed this week. It went to the laundry, and so I picked it up, and it was, it's renewed. It didn't look like this when before I took it to the laundry. Matter of fact, it looked kind of bad. It was all wrinkled up and uh, had a stain on it or two. But I took it to the laundry and it got renewed. And so when I pulled it out this morning, it felt like it was new. But it was just renewed. Jesus said at the renewal of all things that he would set upon his throne. When he would renew all things. John said, I saw a new heaven. And I saw a new earth. And I saw a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice crying and saying, The tabernacle of God is with men, and I shall be their God, and they shall be my people. And I'll wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more death. For behold, I'm making all things new. Write these words, John, for they're true and they're faithful. They'll come to pass. You can bank on it. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to think maybe this will happen. He says, no, it's happening even right now. Because the new Jerusalem's coming down. It's not one day going to be here. It's already in the process of coming down. The Bible said in Hebrews 11, we, 12, we have been come to a, a city that cannot be shaken. We've come into a, a spiritual city it's a, it's a Mount Zion of God where the children of God live, where the children of God exist, where the children of God benefit from everything that's happening in heaven. That as we pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, as that's what's going to happen. What God wants to happen in our lives is what he wants to happen in heaven. He wants heaven to impress upon the earth. And heaven's not that far if you just think about it. Just because it's out of sight doesn't mean it's far away. Some things are so close, we just have to be aware how close they really are. I guess I better read a scripture. So you know I ain't making this up, David. <laughs> I love this scripture. I've always been one of my favorite scriptures. It came on uh, right after the day of Pentecost when there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to read two passages and then you can stop, okay? And um, it came right after the death. Jesus told his disciples after his resurrection, he says, now I want you to go into Jerusalem and I want you to tarry there until the promise comes. For the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And the Bible says they were all in one mind and in one accord and there was in what they called an upper room. And the Bible says the 
tongues of fire came down and set upon each of them. And there was a big wind that blew through. And the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in utter tongues that they've never spoken in. Languages that was of all different kinds of people. And everybody was hearing them speak these languages. And didn't know how they could possibly do that. It would be like, I can't speak French. But all of a sudden I started speaking French. I can't speak Spanish, and all of a sudden I start speaking Spanish. And the Bible says that what they were saying in those other languages were proclaiming the wonderful goodness of God. And they said, God, these people are drunk. And Peter said, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He says, this is what the prophet Joel prophesied, that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And even upon your handmaidens I will pour out my spirit. And all who call upon the name of the Lord will be made whole. Be made whole. And then Peter goes on and he, I love this, but that's a mainstay. It, it's it's it reminds me of how great God is and, and what's going to happen in the future, that the best is yet to come. Best is yet to come. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing, say refreshing. Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. and That he may send the Messiah who was appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time, God, time comes for God to restore everything. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. He's been saying this for a long, long time. And so if you need to know what he's going to restore, you got to know what the prophet said he would restore. And so you have to go back, and that's what we're going to do over the next several weeks is look at some old writings, some ancient scriptures. How many know this book's ancient? Matter of fact, i got an ancient Bible in my hand. It looks new because I don't use it very much, Dusty and was in England years ago, and I said, please get me a Cambridge Bible. They just don't make them over here. I mean, there's no Bible made as strong and as good as a Cambridge Bible. So I'm preaching, I have a Cam I'm going to have a Cambridge Bible this morning. Cambridge. Good stuff. Now my other favorite scripture, and then you can be seated. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Weeping prophet. He he said, uh, God told him he wanted him to go to, to Jerusalem. He wanted to prophesy to the people. And now, this is what he told Jeremiah. I want you to go and say all these things to these people, and they're not going to listen to one single word you're going to say. They're not going to heed one word you're going to tell them. Man, I'd like to have that church. Beard, I want you to preach this morning, but nobody's going to believe a single word you're going to say. It's not going to change anybody's life. It's not going to impact anybody, but I want you to do it anyway. And he was called the weeping prophet. He, he, he said in one chapter, he said, I wish that my head was a pool of water and my eyes were a fountain of tears. And I'd weep day and night for my people. Jeremiah said that from the least to the greatest, they were all bad. He said the prophets were bad, the priests were bad, the fathers were bad, the mothers were bad, the shepherds were bad, everybody was bad. What a church. But he said, I want you to talk to them, and prophesy to them anyway, Jeremiah. And he did. And he said this one verse that resonated in my heart years ago on High Falls Road. That's where I went to college. And um, he said, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you'll find rest for your souls. 
But you said, we will not walk in it. Ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is. Walk in it. You'll find rest for your soul. Gosh, how ancient this book is. Thousands and thousands of years old. Yet how relevant it still is today. What a book filled with life's principles that cause you to live a better life still today. If you just would read the book of Proverbs and gather the wisdom nuggets out of it and live by the, that wisdom, your life would be so much better. He said, I'm just going to take 10 words, the Jews call it, 10 commandments. I'm going to engrave them on stone. They're just 10 simple commandments. But if you live by these 10 simple words, if you will, first four of them deal with how you treat God and love God, the other, how you treat one another. And he said, if you will, uh, Jesus came along and said it this way, hang all the law, hang all the prophets on two commandments, love God with all your heart, your mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I'll give you rest. Now, rest is not always inactivity. Rest sometimes is, is, is rest even in work. You know, when you're doing what you're supposed to do, it's restful even in work. And so rest means sometimes, we went on a golf outing the other week, and um, we played golf on Thursdays, 18 holes, 36 on Friday and 18 on Saturday. And from the youngest to the oldest, they were all wore out. The 20-year-olds and the 70-something-year-olds, they were just as tired as... Matter of fact, the 70-something-year-olds were actually weren't as worn out as the 20-something-year-olds because they're used to playing golf three and four times a week. They're used to it. But David Gamble, you're not used to playing that many holes of golf, and you were wore slap out. You couldn't even come to church Sunday morning because you were wore slap out. You go on a church outing, golf outing, that we... Uh, do for you, but you are wore slap out. And you can't, he can't go to church because he is wore out. So what we had to do, they had to do was get rest. They had to, now we understand rest for our body, but there's also rest for our soul. Rest for our soul. Sometimes, I get more into it in a minute, but um, sometimes rest, I, I realized last week's doing something different. Doing, I had this epiphany that was crazy. My brother was going to Sun City for a political forum last Thursday night. I volunteered to go. I don't like politics. I'm not a political person. I really, I vote, I do my duty, but I don't like politics, David. But I felt like I was supposed to go. And so... I go pick Eddie up, drive him like he's a senator or something, you know. <laughs> I drive him up to Sun City, and we go in, and I mean, this is what I was doing. I was walking around shaking hi. I'm Buren Goss. I'm Eddie Goss's brother. Nice to meet you. Hey, Buren Goss, Eddie Goss's brother. Nice to meet you. I mean, if there had been babies, I'd have been kissing every one of them. I mean, I was, I was being political, and I left there refreshed. I said, this is refreshing. Man, all I had, I didn't have to study. I didn't have to wonder if you're going to believe what I say or agree with what I say. I'm just, hi, my name is Buren. I'm Eddie's Goss's brother. Nice to meet you. That was refreshing. Sometimes times you just need to get out of the rut that you're in. Do something different. I asked my daughter and my granddaughter if I could tell this story. I got two stories to tell about ancient paths that our family uh, had this week, some ancient history and paths. Well, Anna is a teenager, and Anna has got to where when Dusty asked her to do something, she just didn't do it. She just did something else. And Dusty was just had got fed up. And so she gets with Chris and says to Chris, we're going to have a come-to-Jesus meeting with Anna. 
And Chris, you're going to back me up on, on everything I say. You're going to back me up. Anna's not going to be this way. So they're thinking, you know, if you know Anna, they're thinking this is going to be a minimum 30-minute Jesus meeting. Because Anna can convince you you're wrong. She, you can start out thinking you're right, and before you know it, she's twisted you around and you're wrong. Then all of a sudden you say, well, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. I mean, she'll just change your whole mind. I was, I was sharing with, with some leaders I talked about in some of our board meetings in the future. What I want to do is have some, some people of every decade in our meetings just to hear from them. You know, teenagers and 20s and 30s and 40-year-olds. I mentioned John Henry. I said, you don't have John Henry. Somebody said, how about Anna? I said, no way. Anna's not coming to a board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> she ain't ready for that yet. Not Anna in a board meeting. No way. All right, so Dusty walks up to Anna and Chris. They sat down and said, we're going to have a talk. Dusty says, Anna, you got a rebellious spirit. She went old school, man. Ancient past. <laughs> Anna looks at her and says, I got a what? She said, a rebellious spirit. I don't want a rebellious spirit. I'm not going to have a rebellious spirit. No, I'm putting that off me right now. No. That was it. <laughs> All of a sudden, this rebellious teenager starts doing everything mama says. I wish everybody was that quick to repent. Well, if I wish I could just walk up to you and say, you got a rebellious spirit. I don't want that. <laughs> I'm getting that off me. That's how quick we ought to be. That's how quick we ought to be to repent. I don't want that. I don't want that on me. So last Sunday morning, we got about 40-something people down here just worshiping the Lord. And we're in this real time and moment of thanksgiving and meditation to God. Just, just a presence of God that was so strong. Anna was standing right here. And she was kind of leaning up against Chris. And she had this thought. She says, I don't know how anyone can stand in this presence. The moment she said it, a lady fell out. Dusty, I mean, Anna, scared at first she thought she died. And then she realized it wasn't. Dusty explained to Anna, said, we used to call that being slain in the spirit. And I thought, oh, what a terrible word, slain in the spirit. We don't use that term anymore. I think that's not going, sometimes new and old has got to come together. But Anna coined a new phrase. Sometimes you just can't stand in his presence. Sometimes you just can't stand in his presence. Sometimes you just got to fall on your face. Sometimes you just got to kneel before him. Sometimes you just have to bask in this presence of God. He said, times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Times of chaos will come from the presence of the Lord. Thank God for ancient paths. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus comes on the scene. There's a heaviness in Jerusalem. People are burdened down. They are anxiously awaiting a Messiah. They're wanting him to come deliver them from Roman bondage and, and all the stuff that they were in, the mistreatment that was going on. And it came a time in Jesus' life when he looks at him and says, Come unto me, all ye that are burdened and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest for your souls. Say, rest for your soul. For I am gentle and humble, and you'll find rest for you. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He said to the Pharisees, the only people he spoke rude to, <laughs> if you will. I, mean, I don't know any other word to really say it. I mean, it's pretty much. He said, you bind burdens, heavy burdens on people that they can't bear, and you're not willing to help them with one finger of yours. And the people were so burdened, heavy laden, he says, if you come unto me, my yoke is easy. How many are glad his yoke is easy? His burden is light. There's a legend. There's a legend. How many know that Jesus was a carpenter? 
He was raised by Joseph, his father, earthly father. He's a carpenter. And he, was a, he worked in a carpenter shop. And the legend say, says that, that farmers would travel for miles and miles to come, that Jesus' main thing that he built as a young man was yokes for oxen. And he fitted it so well on the oxen, the ox, that it made the, the duty of the ox and the burden of it easier. Yeah. Easier. Jesus came to make life easier. Easier. He came to give you a special yoke that's just right for you. He fits you just right. The Bible says don't be yoked together with certain people. You better be careful who you yoke yourself with. Be careful who you yoke yourself with. But also be careful that you let the Holy Spirit and let Christ fit you with your yoke. My daddy used to tell a story of a young man who told, gave his employer two weeks notice. He said, uh, God's called me to preach. So he gave him two weeks notice and he went about and about two months later, his employer saw him working at another place. And he went up to him and he said, I thought... You said God called you to preach. And he said, that was before he heard me. <laughs> Sometimes our yoke just don't fit. Sometimes we try to do something that's just not, we're just not fitted for. Jesus came to make it easier, not to make it more difficult. He came to make life easier. And you know what? I can honestly say this. I've been doing this for 40-something years. I'm lost in time. I didn't ever think back then, 40-something years, I thought 40 was old. Now I've been ministering for 40-something years. And it's easier now than it's ever been. Easier now than it's ever been. More satisfying now than it's ever been. I love studying. Even with ADD, I can study the scriptures for hours. Now, I may be preparing two or three different messages because I get bored with one. I've done that. I've sat and studied, and I've got three, three different notebooks going and three different messages going at the same time. That's multitasking. Don't pray for that yoke. That yoke's not a good yoke. That that. That ADD is not a good thing unless you unless you got God on your side and He saves you, and then He makes it work for you. That's good preaching. I got it. Amen, Buren. Amen. Amen. He He can make everything work better for you, right? He can. In Luke five, verses thirty six through thirty nine. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece of old of new garment to patch an old garment. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment to patch for. From the new will not match the old. No one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will run out and the wine skins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wine skins and no one after drinking old wine wants the new for they say the old is better. Jesus comes along and he says, I'm going to tell you something that the old is better and the new is better. I want to tell you how to merge these two together, how, to, how a good scribe will reach into his treasure and things old and things new and bring them together and make the old new and the new old. But he says you got to take, you can't put this in an old crusty wineskin. You've got to put it in a wineskin that has been saturated with oil so it's flexible. Say, thank God I'm flexible. I know why most of you didn't say that. I, I know why you sat there going, I ain't, I ain't saying that. Because you knew you was going to lie. You knew if I say I'm flexible, you knew I am not flexible. Well, the Bible says call those things that are not as though they were. So now say, I am flexible. By faith, I am flexible. By faith, the lights will go out. By faith... I am flexible. Say, by faith, I am flexible. 
Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. Blessed are those that can give in. Let me tell you what your soul is. Let's, let's do some old school study. Is that all right? Okay. Your soul is your intellect. Say your intellect. Your will. Your emotions. It's what you think, what you feel, and what you want. What you think, what you feel, and what you want. How many know everybody thinks? I hope. I know some don't think before they, you know, speak or act. It's what you think, what you feel, what you want. Well, rest for your soul is you can think the right way, you can feel the right way, and you can want the right way. That you can have a shepherd who says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why? Because I want the right things. I think the right things. I feel the right things. I was, I was watching um, the Queen of, Queen of England's little birthday bash. You know, she's 92 years old. And my, my daddy got me into this when I was little. My daddy loves England. He loves the king and queen. You would think he's from England. Anything that was about the king and queen of England, daddy was glued to the TV. He loved it. And I think what he loved about it and what I love about it, there's not all of this political jargon with it. <laughs> there's not a Republican king and a Democratic queen. They're just a king and a queen. I love it. And there's all this just peace about it, it seems to me. I mean, when the, the dude gets married this month later on, how many know that everybody's going to be glued to the TV watching two people you don't know <laughs> get married? And all the pomp and circumstance there will be, America will be glued to that because there's just peace about it. Don't you wish we had a country that was just at rest and at peace? We didn't have all this going on. Anyway, I don't want to do that. I'm not political. I kiss babies and shake hands, but I'm not going to get political. Or I may. John chapter 14, verses 23. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth and all things. And one more scripture, and then I'm going to close. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 14. And here's where I'm taking you. This is what I want you to hear. We all need in our life, I wrote down three things. We need an ancient path that God has always had for you and for always wants you to walk in. You need a personal prophet and you need a spiritual perception. Jesus is called in the scriptures our king, our prophet, and our priest. We have seen him as our priest. We love him as our priest, don't we? We love him as our, we love that he is at the right hand of the Father making intercessions for us always. I love that he says, Sin not little children, but if you do, you have an advocate with the Father. If you'll confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And not for your sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. We king because we see him in Revelation coming back on a great white horse and a vesture dipped in blood and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But I don't know how often we have taken him as a prophet. It just hit me this week. I love my prophet Jesus. I love my New Testament prophet who came to this earth to speak God's will and purpose in my life. 
they're not just words in red because Jesus said them. Their prophecies, prophetic words spoken by the greatest prophet who ever lived. We need that prophet to speak in our life. And we need the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, however it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. For no, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him... These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Wow. Daniel called God the ancient of days. The ancient of days. And we have an ancient path that God pre... I know you got to put her down. That's going to kill you, but you got to go to the back to the keyboard. <clears throat> we have an ancient of days who has given us an ancient path that he knew before you were conceived in your mother's womb. Every day that you are going to have, he knew for you. He has a path for you to walk. And when you're walking in that path, you have rest for your soul. You have rest for your soul. And when you get outside that path, there's no rest. I went through a season in my life years ago when I got out of the path that I was walking and was walking another path. It was ministry. It was good. But I wasn't good. It wasn't for me. And I walked in Mike Oliver's office. I'll never forget. He said, Buren... And he said it a little different way, but this is what he said. You're on the wrong path. You need to go back to your original vision. You've got to walk your vision, not somebody else's vision. You've got, to, you've got to do what God's called you to do. And what God called me to do at 24 years of age, when he spoke to me and said, your whole ministry, your whole ministry... Your whole ministry, all the days of your life, this is what you'll preach. You'll begin it and you'll end it. That is all about relationships. It's all about being properly related to the people that God's put you with. It's all about loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, Jesus said, hang all the law and hang all the prophets. And when love ceases to be my motivating factor of my life, when love ceases to be what keeps me properly related to God and properly related to other people, when the love that is to be patient and kind and loving and keeping no records of wrong, always rejoicing, always hoping, always believing, always seeing the best in other people. When faith and hope and love will be the three words that's just not three sounding poetic words of something, but they're the most important words in your life, that faith is seeing what you can't see, believing what you don't see, hope is expecting the very best, and love is overlooking the very worst. And when you can take those three words, put, get yourself on the path of faith and hope and love and stay on that path. Everybody's going on that path. Everybody needs to be in that path. Because if you don't have it, he said, you can give your body to be burned. 
You can be a martyr for what you believe. He said, if you have not love, it's nothing. He said, you can have all faith that you understand all mysteries. You can have, uh, understand all prophecies, but if you don't have love, you're only a clanging symbol and a loud noise. You're nothing. But if you have love, if love is the key, if love is the motivating factor of your life, if love is what you're going to keep everything in line with, if that's going to be it, then life is going to be easy. It's going to be better. Amen? And stand together. God has a path specially designed for you. And you may not be like me. You may be someone that your path may change. Because I said that God said to me, he didn't say to you. I didn't say that God said to you, did I? I said God said to me. God put me on a path. He said, that's your path for your whole life. That's your path for your whole ministry. But you may be on a path that God may change that path. He may change your path. He may put you on this path for a while, then put you on another path for a while. But the main thing to know is I'm in the path. And how you know you're in the path is you have rest for your soul. It's restful. It's peaceful. You rest in it. You're not agitated. I was listening to our wash machine yesterday. And you know, I, I thank God for new wash machines that don't sit there with that agitator going, vroom, vroom. I mean, I, I can't make that noise. You know, y'all remember how it sounded. That's why most people put them outside years ago. They, they built special rooms for them because they had a thing in it called an agitator. I remember hearing my daddy, the agitator's going bad. And no wonder it's going bad. It's an agitator. It's agitating. It's, it's going to go bad. I don't want to be agitated, do you? I don't want to be tribulated, do you? Some people love tribulation. But Dan, y'all can come. I, um, I've said a few statements over the last few weeks that mean everything to me. Okay? The peace that God gives... And I, I hear this over and over and over again, said by theologians and preachers. And I, they say, you, God's peace is not absence of trouble necessarily. How can you have peace in trouble? In my lifetime, I've never had the two together at the same time. I've never had peace and trouble in my life at the same time. They don't, they can't coexist. You can't coexist. You can't be in peace and in trouble. How many has ever been in a peaceful home? How, how many has ever, your life where your mate was just so peaceful? Anybody ever? Come on, raise your hand, Jason. Good boy, get that hand up. <laughs> Jesus. Lord. How many? You, you just, your relationship has just been so peaceful. Anybody has ever experienced this? Raise your hand. Have you ever experienced this wonderful peace? Have you ever, come on now, let's get real. Have you ever had in your marriage, it been un, not peaceful? John, get it up, buddy. Get it up. Uh, give me half mask. Get that thing on up. You know, come on. Yes. Which one you want? When it was not peaceful, I guarantee you there was a reason for it. There was some trouble. There was some trouble. <laughs> I used to have a sign on my desk. I've been a rich monkey and I've been a poor monkey. I'd rather be a rich monkey. I like to get another sign that says, I've, hit, I've been in trouble and I've been in peace. I'd rather be in peace. I don't like trouble. I don't know about you, but I don't like trouble. 
two little boys named None of Your Business in Trouble. You ever heard that? None, none, none of your business got lost. Trouble went to the police station. He says, can you help me find my brother? And uh, he said, I, I'm looking for my brother. He says, well, well what is your, what's your name? He said, none of your business. He said, no, son, what's your name? He said, none of your business. He said, son, you're looking for trouble? He said, yeah, I'm looking for, tr that's my brother. <laughs> Corny, but I don't know. All right, I wish I hadn't said that one. <laughs> but what I'm, trying to say, what I'm trying to say is we want peace. And when trouble comes, the rest is to calm the seas. That's what it's for. It's to calm the troubled seas of your life. And there is a scripture in the book of Revelation, when John is trying to describe this unbelievable person, trying to describe the in indescribable, using words that, I just, just go home and read the book of Revelation, you'll see. <laughs> you'll just be scratching your head most of the time. But he'll see all these descriptions of this God. But I love the one thing that was before his throne. And he said there was a sea of glass. No trouble. No waves, no disruption. The same Christ who was asleep in the storm, who got up and said, peace be still, is the same Christ who's in this boat now. And when the troubled waters come, he stands up inside and says, peace, be still. And he calms the troubled seas of my life over and over and over again. Wow. Over and over again. Sometimes I do it by prayer. Sometimes I do it by study. Sometimes I just do something else. Sometimes I just go fishing. Sometimes I just do something I ain't never done. Hi, my name's Bearden Goss. Eddie Goss's brother. Found rest, found peace. And doing something a little different than I normally do. Stepped outside my comfort zone, Penny. Oh, big time stepped outside my comfort zone. Because you know what? If Eddie asked me to go two weeks ago, you know, you know what I would have told him? No. I, ain't, I don't want to go. But when I told my wife, I think I'm going to go with Eddie. She said, you're supposed to go. I like it when Barbara tells me what to do, what I need to do. She... She told me this morning what I need to do. I, I love it on Sunday mornings when Barbara says, I was praying this morning. I go, oh, oh. I do. I, I know I'm getting a word. And so she gave me this word this morning. I, I'll know when I get home if I obeyed it. <laughs> I, I hope I did. Everybody say, that was good, Beard. Yeah, all right, all right. So I was good. I want you to have rest. I want you to have peace. I want you to bow your head. Father, in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the one that can speak to any storm of our life and calm the troubled seas, the one that can cause us to see what we normally can't see, hear what we normally don't hear, feel what we normally don't feel. You can cause us to think right, want right, and feel right. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. They're going to lead us in a song of dismissal. As we started several weeks back, our tithes and offerings, we no longer pass the buckets. But uh, there's some things on the wall back there. I don't know what you call them. They're not buckets. Box, box, I guess they're boxes. Anyway, you'll see them. You can place your tithes and offerings and your connection card in that. Or as most of you do now, you give online. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for giving. Thank you for helping. Um,
I'll share it with you later, but there, there's a pretty big need we're going to have probably coming up. But uh, won't you be in prayer? Mary Ringo, which is oldest member of our congregation, uh, her husband is in uh, eternal hospice care now and uh, at Brightmoor Hospice. And greatest attitude of anybody I've ever seen in my life. I mean, such a joy to go and see. His attitude is just remarkable. And I went to see him the other day and prayed with him. And I guess I didn't sit long enough with him because I started to leave. And he said, thanks for coming, Bure, and come back when you can stay longer. <laughs> so, I said, Ray, you got it. Next time I'll ch chip out a little more time. We'll sit here and talk a little bit more. But don't you be praying for them. Mary is such one of the sweetest, sweetest people you'll ever meet in your life. Lives the most simple life you could live. I mean, it's the most simple life you could live. And yet she is so content and so fulfilled. And so it rests. Amen. me who 